Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great honor for me. I really have been uh, pleased that uh, I was asked to introduce Lance, whom I have known for so many years, and uh, he really means something for me. And um, when introducing me, I'd like to talk a little bit about his, um, his CV. And I'm not doing that as a bookkeeper, because, but I'm really doing it because I think it means something for the identity of communication. We have heard that there are many sessions that are dealing with the identity of our discipline, and I think uh, Lance's CV has something to say about that. Uh, he um, started um, in political science at the um, University of California at Irvine, then got a master in philosophy in, at Yale, and also got his PhD at Yale, but then switched back to uh, political science. And, uh, for many years now, he is at the University of uh, Washington in Seattle at the uh, West Coast. And uh, since 2000, he has an endowed chair for communication. So that is the first time that communication appears uh, in his uh, CV. And uh, I think that is uh, something um, peculiar um, for our discipline, um, of which uh, Wilbur Schramm once said uh, that it is, a, it is a discipline where many have passed, uh, but few have uh, uh, tallied. And uh, um, I think he has stayed in the field, and uh, um, therefore um, he is um, an exception. Um, he has about 11 books, if I counted that correctly, um, of which uh, most are authored by him, a few have been edited, and I think the first one where, really, where we in communication research outside the US um, um, got, uh, um, first his name was News, The Politics of um, Illusion, published in 1983, then in 1997, Democracy and the Marketplace of Ideas. I picked some of these titles because I think, again, they tell something about the person and the scholar. 2001, Mediated Politics, Communication in the Future of Democracy, and 2008, Civic Life Online, learning how digital media can engage uh, our youth. And uh, that has something to do with the fact that uh, since 2000, he's also the director of the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement, which deals with the engagement, which deals with political interest and uh, what the media, and particularly the new media, can do in order to get young people engaged. As I said, I'm not reading these facts as, uh, as a bookkeeper, but I think there is a theme and um, this theme is uh, twofold. Lance is asking normative questions, or he comes from normative assessments and normative uh, goals that he sees in our societies. That is the first thing. So he's not doing empirical research um, um, just to count um, data, just to count variables, but he does it from a normative uh, viewpoint, uh, thinking about uh, the best way our societies can be organized. This, I think, is the first trait. And the second trait is uh, that he's asking the big questions in our field. And uh, um, a colleague here in Mainz once said that this would also be a peculiarity of the department in Mainz that we ask questions, and I'm switching to German, wo Blut dran ist, where there is blood uh, in the question, where you really can can uh, get involved, where you can get in trouble by asking these questions, also politically in trouble. And uh, Klaus Altman, you just said we have to get more engaged in our discipline. And I think Lenz is one of these people who can serve as a role model how we, as scholars in communication, can get um, engaged. And uh, when he uh, sent an email about the talk that he is giving today, he also started by saying, this is a big picture talk. And I think that fits. You're asking these bigger questions. You're, you're putting yourself in the bird's perspective and um, uh, try to find out where we stay in the field as scholars in communication as well as uh, citizens um, in democracy. So it's maybe one of the assets of the fact that um, communication was nurtured by other disciplines and um, that uh, people like him are asking these questions. And sometimes I'm asking myself if uh, we are losing a little bit this trade in communication research. We are, we're becoming much more professionalized and we're becoming we're recruiting our personnel from the field of communications and uh, the fact that people from philosophy or political science or psychology come into the field uh, becomes more and more rare. And uh, on the one side, it's a sign of professionalization, of coherence. On the other side, it's also maybe sometimes losing the bird's perspective that uh, people like 
lands have and uh, that he will now present to us in his talk. Now I have to put my glasses again. Um, changing media, changing societies, challenges for communication research. Welcome and the floor is yours. I need, I'm number zwei here, so. Okay. One moment. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good. So, vielen Dank. Danke für alle kommen hier früher diese Morgen, Morgen früher. Und uh, das ist alle mein Deutsch. The rest, <laughs> the rest is English, I'm sorry. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I, I'm honored to be here and um, I, I hope uh, we can begin a conversation. Uh, in a way, the ideas that uh, I'm going to talk about today were, were in part inspired by a, a speech that Wolf Donsbach gave when he was ICA president several years ago. And it was kind of a rallying call for rethinking the field, for really assessing where we are and do the studies we undertake match the society we're trying to understand? I think that that's a, a constant question that scientists have to ask. You know, are we in danger of sometimes reifying comfortable old ways of doing research that may grow increasingly out of touch with social reality? Uh, and so I've uh, thought of that call for uh, thinking anew as, as a very important motivation. And uh, so today I'm going to carry some ideas forward. Uh, happily, uh, thanks for this nice theme. I, I have a lot of room to work within from Gutenberg uh, to, to Google. I'm going to concentrate more on the last 100 years of social change and communication systems in the uh, sort of industrial and now post-industrial democracies. So that's still a pretty big topic. I'm going to mention a couple of things about China, because I think we should always engage in comparative work when we can. Uh, and China is a very interesting society uh, these days. Uh, but the big questions I'm asking are, um, are media systems, communication processes, and the effects of those processes changing? And how would we know that? How, and how do we fit change into our existing paradigms and, and ways of doing research? And I take some uh, more recent inspiration also from, from Wolf's paper that I found in the, the conference program uh, today. It, it is a bit like nailing pudding on the wall, um, trying to figure out where the field is, where it's going, and how to put the changing bits uh, in perspective. But knowing Wolf, I'm pretty sure the pudding is going to be securely nailed uh, to, to the wall in, in this paper. Um, at an earlier attempt to nail the pudding on the wall came from an interesting paper by Winfried Schultz in a PVS uh, special issue on political communication a few years back. And, and he created this interesting chart of optimistic assumptions from research and pessimistic uh, assumptions guiding research. And for those with, uh, this is not an eye exam chart, uh, so I'll read a couple of the entries uh, for those in the back. So, so in, in the uh, optimistic approach to research, uh, we have political learning from news. Citizens actually engage with news, learn important information so they can act uh, intelligently as citizens. In the more pessimistic research world, uh, there's been a decline of political interest and corresponding decline of political knowledge, uh, indeed an increase even in political apathy. And so we have these kind of competing sets of assumptions. And, and the question I guess we all ask ourselves is, which is right? Which is uh, more true? Uh, is it optimistic or is it pessimistic? Well, I want to suggest a, a, a different way of thinking about this. They're both right. I'm going to suggest that they're both correct because we are making a transition from the modern society of very integrated, coherent institutions uh, where the media transmits information from the parties and the, 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 the government and the politicians and the public officials to citizens who then respond uh, by voting and uh, taking other kinds of intelligent action to adjust the system. 
Uh, so that's the modern world, but we're entering a different society today, a kind of a late modern. I don't think we have reached postmodern uh, society as yet, although artists have gone there, and writers and painters and so on. Uh, so I think that we are, are really living with both of these social structures in our real worlds. And so depending on which social structures you look at, and indeed which citizens you look at, if you look at younger citizens, they live more in this late modern society. And if you look at older citizens, they live more in the modern world still, holding on very strong to it because it still looks like the best model for uh, society and politics. So rather than asking which is correct, I'm going to argue that they're both in play. And our challenge is really how to put them together in a way that doesn't make us uh, have to choose. So the idea is that perhaps both are in play and that we have this modern social structure that we can actually see still parts of, parties and unions and governments uh, and newspapers. But we also have a late modern society that is fragmenting uh, with a more distributed public sphere. So you can have very active online spaces and, and you can have very active news, uh, quality newspapers and uh, public news uh, channels. Uh, and, and I guess if you wanted to arrange societies, you could begin to think about how to uh, sort of measure societies on a scale. And, and I'm thinking Germany is a little bit uh, leaning more toward the modern uh, structures. And the US is already arrived in the late modern uh, society phase uh, pretty clearly. Although there are plenty of scholars in the US that still treat it as a fully modern society, which I think is not complete uh, a picture of it. So you can think about uh, the world as having these two systems operating within it at the same time. Some of us move freely between the two systems. Others are more centrally living in one of them or the other. Uh, much as the zoo uh, offers a very uh, organized experience of the shark, it tells us what kind of shark and what it does and what it eats. And it keeps us in a very close but kind of uh, managed relationship to it. And Damien Hirst, uh, an artist, has introduced to us a very different experience of the same thing, the shark. And we have to work out our own meanings and our own understandings. And so, so the modern world more or less organizes meanings for people. The late and postmodern world, we have to do a lot more of the work uh, to create those meanings in, in society. Indeed, if you think about uh, uh, scholars who've talked about this, you can think of Anthony Giddens pointing toward this transition. You can think of Ulrich Beck uh, having described this transition. And uh, so I want to explore it a little bit further today. So as many democracies shift from a modern to a late modern social system, what are some of the changes that we, we notice? Well, first of all, there's been a reorganization of public life. Many of the core institutions of the modern society are beginning to fragment. Political parties, unions, churches, school systems, and so on are under stress. Uh, there is stress in, in the German versions of these institutions. I think Germany has worked very hard to keep those institutions together, free public uh, education, continued support uh, for labor unions, and so on. The United States uh, has really turned these institutions upside down uh, in many ways. The result of this reorganization of public life that's going on to different degrees in different societies is that there's been a change in the media and communication systems. I mean, media really serves society in, in, in important ways. And so as society changes, it wouldn't be surprising to discover that media systems change along with it. So we see almost everywhere in the uh, post-industrial democracies declining journalism, fewer jobs for journalists, uh, smaller audiences for news, uh, quality news, uh, and more the rise of crowdsourced content that travels along social networks. And I want to come back to that because that's a, for many of us, especially those of us who prefer the modern system, that's a disturbing trend. Uh, and, and I want to suggest that there are reasons to be disturbed by this, but there are also reasons to find it quite interesting and uh, simply a fact of life. Sometimes our values get in the way of seeing change and accepting it as just a fact of life that we might want to understand uh, better. 
And, and then that leads to an interesting way of rethinking communication. I mean, in the modern world, uh, communication is part of a system. And, and uh, you know, systems theorists tell us where different kinds of communication processes fit in a bigger system of institutions and elections and parties and citizens. Uh, but I think that we're moving beyond the phase, if we're trying to understand the change process, I think we're beginning to move beyond uh, thinking of communication as the exchange of messages and the effects of those exchanges. That's still going on. Don't, don't panic. It's still happening. Um, but, but I think we also are in a point where, as social structures change, communication is becoming an organizational process. And I'm going to talk about how that works in a minute, because we're seeing more and more signs of communication as social and political organization, which I find very exciting uh, just to try to understand. So each of these changes creates certain challenges for communication research that I'm going to run through fairly quickly. Um, there, there's a lot of data that's coming up, but uh, I understand some of you were out rather late last night. Uh, and, and I have jet lag, so we may not dwell as long on the data uh, as uh, we dwell on some of the ideas here. So, so what's in the background of all these change? Well, for now, let me just wave my hand at the, the big explanation called globalization. Okay, we've, we've come to uh, live in a much more interdependent world, uh, as you all know too painfully well. Uh, Germany has the entire European Union to deal with at the moment. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of interconnected processes that didn't exist in the same way 40 years ago, uh, which has produced this decline in social structure, fragmentation, if you will, the rise of the personalization experience of life in society itself, but also the personalization of political communication, which is made much more possible by the slow uh, supplementation, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't think we should say replacement yet, of mass media systems with uh, social networks, sometimes social networks on a very large scale. So let's look at uh, change number one, the reorganization of public life. I'm just going to run through these points because it's more interesting if we talk about them, I think. Um, we, we know that the parties all over the post-industrial world are declining in voter loyalty, are using much more personalized communication to appeal to voters using marketing and branding uh, rather than ideological appeals. Meanwhile, governments have been pressured uh, to privatize a lot of public systems and services, uh, and business has become an increasingly large power, witness the financial crisis that has still the entire world uh, uh, rocking in its, its uh, wake. So what are some of the changes? Uh, again, sweeping changes, so this is very general, but uh, inequality has grown. Inequality, as we know, is a troublesome thing for democracy. So that's why we might want to be concerned about the growth of inequality. Decline of parties on the left, you may not think that's a problem if you're a member of a party on the right. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there might be some reason why you want to still have parties on the left uh, that are viable, uh, and, and they're not so viable in a lot of places today. With uh, matching the rise of the center-right governments that have come into power, which has focused on the further breaking up of society in the name of creating more choice for individuals, this personalization process. So I may have more choice if I live even in Sweden today over schools, over health care, over all kinds of public services that were formerly more or less uniformly provided to everyone as public goods. And then we have this interesting rise of extreme uh, parties that have always been in the picture, but today the parties are really asserting themselves over questions of who are we as Swedes? Who are we as Americans? Who are we as Germans? So we have a, an interesting question about who are we as a people, as these institutions that once helped us imagine our communities together on a large scale are beginning to uh, disappear. Here's one of my favorite factoids. I've spent a lot of time in Sweden over the last few years. And uh, in 2010, when I was there, uh, for the second time, a center-right government was elected. But in voting polls before that election, we learned that half of the Swedish voters under 30 
had no political party identification. That's shocking for Sweden. What was also shocking for Sweden is that they woke up on that election morning to discover that a radical uh, anti-immigrant party had gotten into parliament. And that party, the Sweden Democrats, which I'll talk about again in a minute, um, is actually continuing to grow in popularity uh, to this date. So the German decline in party identification uh, is also well documented, uh, more so in the East. But as you can see, no matter how you cut the German data, its uh, party identification is going down. So what do we have? Let me take a moment uh, to summarize so far. We've got as common interests in society begin to decline, you have less common information seeking. I mean, what is it that drives people to want the same information? It is sharing an institutional order together, I think. So as that institutional order becomes more fragmented, people don't need the same information. Indeed, people don't want the same information. And we have, at the same time, through technology change, more and more channels for information that people can choose among which results in the loss of gatekeeping control both from institutions that produce a lot of information and the media uh, institutions that communicate that information to public. So gatekeeping loss is something that I'm very interested in because that's one of the things that held the old modern society together by allowing us to imagine who we are as, as peoples. So one of the communication research challenges that I draw from this uh, set of changes that I'm seeing uh, in many societies is that, that we have many imagined communities now, whereas in the modern world, we tended to have a dominant imagined community with maybe others fighting for some attention around the edges. So we have extremist parties, the Sweden Democrats. This is uh, the very nice looking young man uh, who has a very nasty political program who's leading the Sweden Democrats. Uh, the Tea Party in the US is fighting over who are the real Americans, I mean, and, and including challenging that the president of the United States at the moment is not among them, is not a real American. We have the Berlusconi phenomenon in Italy, which has lately been replaced by the Grillistas, uh, which are an even more bizarre form of, of claims on uh, political uh, ideas. So as changes in public life go forward, we, we would understandably expect changing media systems to follow them. Now, there's an interaction, of course, so I'm not going to worry too much about what's causing what. They, they produce each other, I think, uh, is the answer. But one thing we know is that journalism jobs are disappearing uh, in all the countries, as you know here as well. Oh, thank you. Oh. That's why I'm here. Oh, well, that's very kind. Yeah, heavy drink out. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and then here's the part that I think is really important. Uh, we can talk about why journalism jobs are disappearing, but one factor that I would like to suggest is that the audience is disappearing. Um, Young citizens are changing their information habits, uh, consuming less news, and finding information from other places than quality news. So uh, again, this is well documented. I want to start with Sweden, just so that I don't dwell on any single country in, in this discussion and, and suggest that these trends can be observed to different degrees in different countries. Um, this is in Swedish, so I'll do a quick translation. Um, this is daily news consumption in the 15 to 29-year-old demographic and the 65 to 85-year-old, so the, the two extremes. There's two things to notice here. Look at just the volume differences. Look at how huge the, so, so this is um, the evening news report on Swedish public television. Almost 90% of this age bracket watches it. And, and look, there, there isn't any news source over there in the younger audience that reaches uh, more than 50%. The other thing that I find extraordinary is none of the public television news, regional or national, is on the news charts for the young audience. Now, many people want to believe that young people will come around, that they will eventually start behaving like their grandparents. I want to argue that because of the social change processes that we tend not to 
be tracking as well as I think we could, uh, that's not going to happen. Sorry. Um, I, I was talking to someone who's been doing a lot of studies on this uh, last night at the party, and he said, yes, but there are, going, there are these um, Lichtturm media that are going to draw them back in like beacons on the ocean drawing ships back to the news. I, I love the image. I think it's very poetic and, and very optimistic, but I think it's too optimistic. Uh, indeed, uh, the CEO of Swedish uh, Public Television uh, did a front page piece in one of the Stockholm dailies uh, while I was there, basically saying that we've lost the demographic of 25 to 55 year olds. That's a large demographic to lose. It's a seriously large demographic to lose. And they don't know how to do programming of any sort to attract this demographic, particularly news programming. So Swedish television is going through a, a quiet crisis about this. Uh, here's the German audience trends. Those little red things are the young audience, 14 to 39. So the demographic is it's not just 29-year-old uh, ceiling anymore. It's now up to 39 in order to just see them at all. That's news, whether you're looking at public or private news sources. Um, and this is newspaper readership in hours per day. And these are demographics born in 1920, 1900, 1910, 1930, 1940, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. So those are all the demographic trends. And you notice that it's not hard to interpret this chart. Here are the grandparents and the great-grandparents, and look at uh, where they are. And they you know, started out w with less hours per day in the news when they were young. And as you would hope, they spent more and more time as they became mature citizens. But now the, the later generations are spending very little time at any point in their life as these trends go forward. Uh, you can see the generational declines pretty clearly from this chart. And, and by the way, I'd like to, to thank uh, some of my colleagues, Frank Esser and Winfried Schultz, for uh, pointing me to some of uh, these data and for uh, n at least not, not telling me to please don't show that. That would be crazy. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, your uh, support on this. But this is reading a newspaper every day on the top. And you see 14 to 19, 20, 29. So, so all of these age groups. But what seems to me to be very important is to look down at different years in which surveys were taken. So if you look at the uh, youngest groups in 1989, almost half of them were reading a newspaper every day. And now it's 26%. If you look at the next age bracket, 57% were reading uh, a newspaper in 89. So you see there was, was an upward trend. But now the trends are moving down. And indeed, the gap is growing between uh, the young and the old as cohort analyses have been done over time. And then if you look at what people are watching, if you remember that earlier chart with the little red bars distinguishing public TV and private TV, um, so, so the light blue here is RTL and sat -Eins. The dark blue is ARD, ZDF. And on the top, you see what the content is. And, and uh, what, not surprisingly, ARD, ZDF are showing on the news are the things you would want the citizen in the modern society to know. What is the government doing? What is the election campaign saying? Uh, what are the big events of the day? Wars, important. What you discover, though, is that uh, what's happening on the privates is accidents bad weather, uh, murders, shootings, and mayhem in society. And uh, younger citizens are watching that stuff, and older citizens are watching the good news, I mean, the quality news. Uh, indeed, people are even saying now, and this is Allensbach data coming from many years, um, that, that younger citizens don't feel that they want to be up on current events, that they even want to be able to talk about current events. So what's going on here? Well, I think the media systems are changing for younger demographics. As those demographics fall away from the quality press, where are they going? Well, one conclusion could be that they're going into deep, dark areas of ignorance and unknowing. 
Um, I don't know if I'm quite ready to pronounce that judgment yet. One place they're going is places like Neon, where they find a different news format. They get news here. They also get uh, social friends uh, networks, and they, they get uh, fashion style, music, food. The whole lifestyle menu that a young person feels he or she needs in order to connect with the youth culture. But there is news here, but it's news with a different logic to it. And here's the uh, founding editor of Neon, who says that most young people today are not interested in politics. Right? They're interested in political issues, but not politics. That's an interesting distinction. I think it's a profoundly insightful distinction. In Germany, there's a great distance and almost cynical attitude toward this party spectacle. A story such as, quote, the new shooting star of the FDP, I don't think people could care less. But political topics in general, yes. Dealing with problems in our society, yes. We simply tell the stories differently than we would if we were a, a conventional journalism organization. So where else are they going? So they're going to places like this where they get a different kind of political information. And they're also going to places like this. This is a vast network dealing with economic justice issues, fair trade policies. Indeed, it's a policy network that is trying to pressure the government, in this case of the UK and through it the EU, to change its trade policies, which is a hugely important set of policy topics in the world today, as, as we all know. And in these organizations are church groups, uh, NGOs such as Oxfam, uh, and uh, the Fair Trade Association, which labels all the fair trade far handels products uh, in the UK. I can show you a very similar map to this uh, for Germany. And what I've found in both Germany and the UK and other countries I've done these networks uh, in and followed them over many years is that there are hundreds of organizations whose web traffic numbers in the millions, so it's not tiny and obscure, and interestingly enough, who produce events and run campaigns that create public activities that conventional media cover. So these networks actually do end up getting messages into the quality press, uh, but they do it by directly communicating information to citizens who then take actions that then make the news. So it's a very different kind of direct engagement with information and with political uh, participation. And all of this is made possible not just by the websites, and I can talk later about what we do with these little dots. Each of them represents an organization, and we drill into each of those organizations, and we measure all of the digital media uh, affordances in these websites and what's going on with those affordances. So we have a complete inventory of all the media that's in play in these networks and the key activities going on with those media. And I can share the methods for doing this if you're interested. But it's, it's made possible because on the receiving end of that communication are young people primarily who have high rates of use of social networks. So these organizations don't behave as old political organizations in the modern society where you manage the participation of your members. They invite young people to then invite their friends, their social networks, into these causes. So you have a very complex set of social networks evolving uh, that is age skewed as well, but you can see that the skew is just the opposite of what it was with the conventional media uh, audience trends. That the younger you are, the more you use social media, and indeed the more you can't imagine living without it. I love that little questionnaire from, from Allensbach that can you live, can you imagine living without your handy? Absolutely not, if you're uh, under 30. Can you imagine living without your social network? Absolutely not, if you're under 30. So this becomes an extension of the information process that is driving a lot of issues in the younger demographics who want their politics to be built around their lifestyles not around their party identification, which doesn't exist. So flipping now really quickly to China, where I've been spending some time lately, because it's got a fascinating problem, which is the same problem, 
only the Chinese don't like it so much. They really don't like it. They allowed all of the social media from the West to be cloned. Uh, so they have Twitter, only it's called Weibo, and you can't get Twitter in China unless you have a VPN. You, you, you have something that's the equivalent of Facebook, looks just like Facebook, only uh, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't get any money from it. And what's interesting is the Chinese thought that this was going to be a great business system, that it was going to drive lots of people to entertainment, to pay for services, to buy things online, which they do. 83% do use uh, this um, social media system to, to communicate with their friends. But the thing that the Chinese didn't figure is 74% of Chinese, mainly young Chinese people, use it as their primary news source, bypassing the party news organizations, which no one believes in China, probably not even the party, uh, but certain, also bypassing, more importantly, the private newspapers, which have grown all over China, which was the party's idea of a safety mechanism that they could somewhat control the content of, but that would become more credible and closer to the people. But those newspapers are also being bypassed in favor of direct news feeds from uh, your social networks. So a, a shocking study that was done in China just a few years ago found that according to survey samples, 65% of the hot news items start with social media and never get to the newspapers, 65%, whereas only 45% uh, start on traditional media, and there's, there's some overlap of, of, the, of both um, in this survey. So now uh, the Chinese scholars are beginning to chart the news in China by monitoring and harvesting massive amounts of data and finding out where the real news is coming from. So you can't figure out where the real news in China is coming from by reading a newspaper or watching television. You need to monitor the social networks, and that is being done uh, for good and for uh, not so good purposes. So what's my communication challenge that comes out of all of this? Whether we look at the trend in Germany, whether we look at the trend in China, is that we need to, in our journalism education and our communication research, begin to consider the possibility that what people consider to be news is changing, and that a lot of citizens are making news that other citizens believe enough to share with their friends along their trusted networks. So this, for example, I think is a sign of the times. Uh, the, the Polk Journalism Award is a prestigious American award for the sort of the top news report of the year. Turns out for the first time ever, it was given to an anonymous person who was just a citizen in Tehran, Iran, who took a picture of this uh, young woman, Neda, who was killed by the police during the protests following the 2009 election in Iran. And this made international news. It had more viewership than any television program that could run it would ever have gotten, directly on YouTube. And then it was run also on all of those television news programs, or most of them, because it was regarded by many journalists as the best news source they could get from a country where they could not get their journalists in. So here's the first Citizen Journalism Award given out by a journalism uh, prize committee. But crowdsourced information isn't all good. There's a lot of rumors uh, floating around the internet, and as the gatekeeping structures break down, they often make it into the news. So as, as uh, I said, we've got a problem with people accusing our president of not being a real American. Uh, and this rumor has been running around the internet for five years, and it gets into the news regularly in the nightly news, in the New York Times, in the quality press. So there's another side of internet rumors in the absence of a strong gatekeeping capacity getting into the quality press. So the final thing I want to talk about is as public life changes, the social structure changes, as media systems change, the role of communication in society is changing too. So that's kind of the bottom line here, to think about how the role of communication is changing from many of the ways in which we are currently studying it. 
Um, I first began to think about the idea that communication is not just sending and receiving messages. That's still going on behind uh, the scenes here. But communication importantly helped to organize large-scale political protests in places like Egypt, in which civil societies had long since been broken down by policing them. So there are different ways you can fragment a civil society on which a media system depends. Uh, you can either submit it to changes of globalization, uh, as the post-industrial democracies have, have undergone, or you can police it out of existence. But either way, people look for new ways to communicate and to use communication. In the US, we had uh, the Occupy protests, which were importantly uh, sending messages, yes, we are the 99% became an iconic message from those protests and really traveled through all kinds of media channels after it left people's cell phones and, and computers. Uh, but, but the protests themselves were importantly organized by social media. Here's a crowd in Spain doing a similar kind of thing, different reasons, different targets, different demands. But uh, the largest protests in the, the, the history of Spain occurred uh, around the same time that all of these other global protests were happening. Something like 8 million people out of a Spanish population of 40 million said to pollsters that they had participated in one way or another in these protests. That's not a, a sort of a narrow minority. It's a very substantial part of the Spanish public. I was in Barcelona when a million people walked through the streets, and I noticed the demographic shift between the people marching in the street who are mostly under 30, as you would guess, and the people on the sidewalks cheering them on, which were their parents and their grandparents. Um, so some colleagues of mine in Spain have been interviewing protests for a number of years. They've been interviewing conventional protests, such as regional autonomy demonstrations, uh, pro-life protests, and, and a general strike that occurred around the time of these uprisings of the 15M or the 15th of May movement, which is what the indignados uh, call themselves. And some interesting differences. If you, if you interview people who participated in the uh, indignados uprising, only 38% of them could name an organization they belonged to that had a street address. What's that about? So they, they, they could identify organizations, but they couldn't, the organizations they identified mostly had no street addresses, which means, what is that? That people think of websites as organizations. Sorry about that, but it's true. People do think of websites as organizations today. And the average age of these organizations was three years compared to 10 to 43 for unions and, and anti-abortion uh, organizations and regional autonomy groups. And the interesting thing is, in the Indignados uprising, which had social media as its organizational structure, uh, you couldn't join the organizations. You could identify with them, but you couldn't become members. So we're in a, what B Bruce Bember has called a sort of a post-bureaucratic era of organizations you associate with, but you cannot join. So the challenge here is that we're moving beyond communication. Now, we're not leaving it. There's still plenty of modern communication going on. Pick up your newspaper, and you'll see it there. But beyond it, we're seeing communication that is as much devoted to organizing people in the absence of them belonging to conventional organizations and for us trying to study it, we are faced with massive amounts of data. I mean, you know, we take surveys, and if we have 20,000 cases in a survey, we think it's a huge amount of data. Most of our surveys are one to 2,000 cases. We did a study of the Occupy movement in the US, and we have 60 million cases. We, have all, all, we think we have all of the tweets uh, from the Twitter streams of, of Occupy. So we have really started to face new research challenges. So we took the 60 million tweets, arrayed them over time, sampled 30,000 of them, and had a brave team of undergraduates code them for different kinds of content. Uh, 30,000 is, is you know, a small sample of a 60 million data set. 
We coded uh, 30,000 of them. We tagged them with different kinds of information. A is conventional news information, which you can see was a substantial part of the links that Occupy protesters inserted in their tweets. But G over there is my personal story, my personal video, my personal blog post about the Occupy demonstration. That was even bigger than the number of news links. So people are doing their own news reporting. We tagged them, and then we threw them back into the big data set so we could see how they traveled through these 60 million uh, links. So social media are, are creating huge data, and we need to think differently about analyzing it. Some things I've learned is you need a team. You can't do it alone, but you can't just do it with other communication scholars. You need to team up with computer programmers, information school archivists, and so on. We have new methods for identifying what the patterns are. We're moving beyond statistics. Everything is significant when your N is 60 million. Uh, <laughs> seriously. And so visualization is beginning to replace statistics in terms of, of demonstrating effects. We have new approaches to error uh, estimation, which I can't go into now because time is, is running out. But, but how we think about error in these data sets is totally different than how we think about it in our, our conventional research. And we need theory. You can't go in, you can't wander into a 60 million uh, N data set without a strong sense of what's your question and why is it an important question. Um, we're also going to sort of move beyond conventional content analysis to semantic networking analysis. This is a semantic map I drew of the impact of Occupy protests on the mass media discourse in the US in which Occupy eventually occupied Barack Obama and pushed him into the discourse on inequality, which he had not been part of in the first three months of Occupy. When I did my maps in uh, September of 2011, when Occupy began, Obama was sort of not on the map. And he moved to the center of the discourse over time as he was pressured to address this issue. So to conclude, what do we maybe want to think about in terms of communication research during this time of change? Um, most of us are still going to do what we've always been doing, so that's fine. And we're still going to find stuff, and that's fine. Um, but we also might want to understand what we're not finding or what we're not looking at, and then uh, look at that a little bit more. And that's what my talk has been about, is what are some other things that are going on that we want to address? And then bridge differences between the two systems of communication that are now in play in most of our societies, which means developing new theories, developing new methods. Uh, but I think it's a pretty happy challenge that we are faced with right now. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Um, Big picture, as you announced, and mm. let's have some distance between us. It becomes <laughs> tradition at DG Puck that we invite liberal intellectuals from the US to do some bashing of their country first. But then you became, Bob Entman talked last year. Oh. So, okay. And, uh, um, but then you became very optimistic, which is again unusual because most of the time intellectuals are not optimistic, they are pessimistic. That's how they make money, by being mm. critics of, uh, of mm. society. And uh, I'm wondering now on this second, uh, yeah, I, I talked about the two facets of your um, career as a scholar, the big picture and the um, and um, asking, and um, on the other side, um, um, asking normative questions. At some point, you gave us an idea of where you see challenges of this situation and this change that you describe, where society comes together and uh, uh, that there is some kind of a validity in the information that uh, arrives in people's heads. Do you see that as a, as a challenge? Do you see that as a problem in, um, in the organization of social communication as you describe it here with the social networks and so on and so far and the, and, um, the decline of the traditional media brands? I do see it as a problem. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it seems to me that to the extent that we are really living in two societies, um, extremely so in the US, less so in Germany, and, and then you can arrange other countries in between. Um, we sort of don't know what the other 
half of society is doing or why they're doing it. I mean, it, it was once the case that the, the nightly news sort of explained that to us. Um, now I think that, that some of us are watching the nightly news, some of us are reading the quality papers, and we kind of don't know who those other people are out there that we keep seeing, but we don't understand any longer. So, so I think that there is a, a kind of a, a miscommunication as these different systems go off in, in somewhat different directions. Um, the discussion is open for everyone. I just usually you don't get a question right away. That's why I was prepared to have one. And we have one in the back. And if you please would identify yourself so that Lance knows whom he's talking to. Hello, I'm Mary Mueller from Jacobs University, Bremen. Thank you very much uh, for your gripping uh, presentation. Um, and you said yourself in one of the last sentences uh, that visualization is replacing statistics. And I noted that uh, your presentation was heavily based on visuals from the NEDA uh, mobile phone shot to the Facebook and the Arabic Spring in Egypt. And I wondered, um, whether you think that uh, communication science, and particularly in, in the US, but also in Germany, uh, is ready methodologically and theoretically to deal with um, uh, the visual and potentially the multimodal dimension of this, um, mm -hmm. uh, of this shift and paradigmatic change in um, communication? Uh, no. I don't uh, think we're ready, but I, I wasn't ready myself a year ago when I was invited to join a team uh, of computer scientists and information school faculty uh, to think theoretically about this big data set that they had gathered but weren't quite sure what to do with. And so I was more than happy to jump in, but we also realized that the current visualization, and it's not just that communication scholars aren't ready for this, it's that no one is ready for this that the current visualization software cannot handle the volume of data. Uh, so so we, can, we can visualize 30,000 tweets, uh, but we can't visualize 60 million of them. And you wouldn't want to look at the picture even if we could. It would be too messy. So, so really what we need to do is think very creatively about how to visualize and also to, to hire people who do computer graphics uh, to join our research teams. So, so one of the very promising developments in the US <clears throat> as big data became the, the new trend in, in, in society, really, um, from government and parties using it to advertisers mining it uh, to, to Twitter generating it and selling it and sometimes giving it to us uh, poor academics, that one of the things that the, the government uh, funding in the US has now started to do is to require that these teams be multidisciplinary. So our next project, we will have um, technology design uh, scholars, we will have computer scientists, we will have information school faculty, we'll have me, uh, but we're also going to hire someone who does custom computer graphic work so they can run along in parallel to the rest of the team and figure out how to display the data once we have crunched it and figured out what it's telling us. Coming back from methods to, to the object again, Lance, the, um, you mentioned the 30 million, you say, well, big data, um, but it's not, the unit of analysis is not people, but it's tweets. It's tweets. And um, yeah. the question is of how many people and uh, how many of those tweets then deal with what we would call in a traditional sense, you know, political issues. Mm -hmm. um, in a study that we did, the number of uh, bloggers and uh, social media that uh, were a source of information on political issues in a traditional sense, you know, most important mm -hmm. issue of the day or of the previous day was almost not, almost not measurable. I think mm -hmm. we had two in 1,800 sure. people. Sure. And um, when you look at, you showed that picture of this woman that was dying in the street. Mm -hmm. um, uh, YouTube praises itself that 38% of the access to YouTube are to what they call news, but then you find out that 80 million of this is looking at the tsunami mm -hmm rolling in sure. and people dying and you know, cars and, uh, and boats floating around. So uh, is that, are we not overestimating the, the news and, and politics importance of the social media? E perhaps if we look at the whole of it. But in, in these moments of, of large-scale political organization, 
it's heavily about politics. So, so it's true that, that the 60 million tweets we have from Occupy isn't the majority of all tweets by any means, but that's enough volume to actually help people who had no political organization to speak of, who didn't want to be led by conventional political organizations, who told parties to keep out, told unions to keep out, policed it, it was enough to give them an organizational capacity. So it seems to me that th that's maybe a different way of looking at social media is, is when does it become political and what are the differences in those forms of politics from the forms we understand in the mm. modern world? The question, but the question is, do, what is the net, the net, or is there a net gain? What is the balance? Do we engage more people than we did before? Or is it just not replacing <clears throat> uh, ways of communication between those who have been engaged and committed in the first place? And mm. uh, you know, when you mm. look at some of that, I remember mm. that quote from Seoul who said, uh, I think in 2000 or 2001, there has never been a generation in the US that was so little interested in politics uh, than now, and if you look at the Pew data, political knowledge, duty to keep informed is on the decline, and so on and so forth. So the question is, do the social, do the social media have the potential mm -hmm. to change that, or is it not just a replacement of the same group? Well, but I think the quote from the founding editor of Neon provides a clue mm -hmm. to answering that question. He made the subtle but important distinction between politics, which has to do with governments and parties and officials and the press, and political issues that are of concern to people because they affect them in their personal lives. And, and a lot of young people don't want to think about uh, the environment, don't want to think about immigration, human rights, as filtered by the elite system of the modern society. I mean, that's the system we find comfortable, and we, we sort of identify that system with democracy. On the other hand, if young people are still involved in political issues, but not involved in that way, my only concern is that we as communication scholars at least try to understand that. I mean, we can judge it. I mean, you say that I'm normative, but I'm, this is actually one of my bold ventures into pure empirical work. I just want to understand what's going on before I begin to decide whether it's good, bad, or, or, or in between. Well, that's a good starting point, always, I know. Um, are there any further questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm Mary Amart from the University of Düsseldorf. Again, thank you for your inspiring talk. And coming back to this question, is there really a problem? Well, maybe there is something that we're missing when we have more of this sort of late modern activism, as we may call it, because basically it's lacking organizational power that in the modern institutions would allow all these issues to be um, fed into the political system and come to sort of decisions um, come to an outcome. Mm -hmm. While social media and activism in the street may allow you to express your um, opinion and maybe vent your frustration and anger, that doesn't necessarily um, lead to any consequences beyond that. So maybe this mm -hmm. could be um, an area where future research is needed if people stop um, engaging in the traditional modern institutions. Absolutely. Wonderful question. Just a couple of quick uh, observations about that. One of the things we're looking at is how a communication produces political organization and how that political organization compares with the old modernist organizations such as parties and social movements and so on. And, and, and there are some similarities and some differences and uh, some things it seems to be doing better and some things it seems to be doing worse. So let me uh, quickly sketch a couple of these different large-scale mobilizations that we've seen in the last few years. The Occupy protests in the United States, successfully with the semantic network analysis that I did, it, it's clear that they successfully took the question of inequality, which had been ignored by the political elites of both parties for 25 years as it grew uh, very, very fast and got it into the center of mainstream media discourse. So that's quite an outcome. If you're looking at media uh, outcomes, that was really a huge achievement to take a, an important but neglected issue and push it into media discourse all over the, the mainstream press. Um, on the other hand, they fell apart. 
they fell apart because what, what were they supposed to do? I mean, you know, how could they have become a, a, a stable political organization in a system that many of them did not trust? Uh, so in Spain, we see the indignados debating among themselves, should we form a political party? I mean, that would be the sensible thing to do in a modern political system. So there was a huge debate in Spain, should we form a political party? Most of them decided no, because the system is regarded as broken. The system, the, the Spanish system is regarded as completely unable to make decisions independent of the Euro crisis. And, and the Euro crisis is causing the protest in the first place. So if, if, they can, if the government of Spain, whether it's left or right or center, cannot address these issues independently, what good would forming a small party that could only hope to gain a minority of seats in, in parliament, what good could it do? Same thing happened in Egypt. There was intense work after uh, the government was toppled, so that's not nothing. I mean, there's, there's an outcome that's pretty impressive. They got rid of a very bad government. But then there were all of these discussions about how do we organize? They were incapable of organizing a political party and so the irony of the Egypt case is that the one civil society organization that was left in place by the, uh, by the Mubarak government became the new uh, government. So, so the very thing that very few of the, the protesters in Tahrir Square wanted to happen did happen because this social media organizing doesn't seem to have the capacity to produce modernist political organization. So there's a weakness there, to be sure. And I, I think that's the kind of comparative analysis we, we should be doing. And that brings us to an end with this session. We need the break before the next sessions uh, so that you can have your coffee and uh, uh, the book stands uh, maybe do some, make some turnover. <laughs> I think one thing that you said is very important and uh, uh, symptomatic for your work. You said you want to do the empirical research to understand before you make a judgment. And I think that is important, as it is important to have normative viewpoints that uh, point us which topics we mm. select and uh, where we do our research on so that it doesn't become you know, random and uh, mm. ephemeral. And I think sure. uh, what you said today in your talk and also in the discussion represents very well where you stand and uh, why it was a very good idea to invite you for this keynote. Thank you very much, Lance. Thank you very much. Thanks.